Welcome to Linux for the Rest of Us, episode number 53, the show on the Podnuts Network where we talk about Linux, as you can tell by the name of the show, and it's not for a few people, it's for the rest of us, hence the second part of the name of the show. And what we do basically is we bring Linux news, Linux distros, Linux goodness of all kinds and sorts from all quarters to the show, but it's not me who brings the goods. It is our friend, Steve McLaughlin, the door-to-door geek from door to door What's up, Steve? Oh, feeling much better. I haven't podcasted for three days, so I was feeling rusty. Damn, man. You're st- three days. How could you bear, your, bear it? I don't know. It, it was hard. It was hard. Well, I'm glad that you didn't lose your touch in three days. Yeah. I mean, it's good well, to- I, you know, stood in front of a mirror and talked for a while. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Record it next time you do that, would you? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, well, um, good to have you on podcast. Let's see if you still got your chops after the three-day break. Um, <laughs> what do you want to bring today? Okay, um, first I wanted to bring up, and I honestly, I, I, as soon as I heard it on another podcast, I immediately jumped into the notes like five, six days ago, and I typed this in, and I don't remember why I typed. I don't remember what podcast it was and what the conversation was that spurred this. But, but but I want to say it was Matt Rainey. Um, why? Um, okay, with operating systems, period, in general, some people feel like with uh, Linux, there is too much choice. There's too many options. Why can't there be just one or two? You know, I don't understand this. You know, so many choices. It's overwhelming. You don't need that many choices. Da, 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 da. I hear that actually kind of a lot, of course, from people that don't use Linux or from people who are just jumping into it. And this is my thing back to them. And this is the basic, basic part. Okay. No Android device, no iPhone, no BlackBerry, no WebOS device, no iPad, no Windows laptop, no Windows netbook, no Chromebook, no Mac Lion this, no Mac Snow Leopard that, no Windows 7 this, no Windows Vista Ultimate, no Windows 7 Basic. None of them are acceptable to any user out of the box. Period. They never were. When I started using computers back in Windows 3.1, it still wasn't acceptable. You always needed something else on the computer. Whether it was Office back in the day, some kind of audio editor, some kind of extra game on the computer, to to today, where we have entire services like Night Night devoted to helping you customize your base install as quick as possible to get it up closer to where you want it. Okay. Now, the reason there's so many different Linux distros is I look at my setup on my computer and I feel like the way I have this setup, the programs I have installed, the way I have the desktop arranged, how many panel bars I have, what kind of little gadgets I have down here, I feel would be beneficial to somebody else. So I can create that as an ISO file and redistribute it. I.e. Linux, every single time for every single user need is closer to being what you need as a final result than any other operating system. Now, other operating systems might eventually get you more direct to what you need. But from a starting off point, Linux is closer, you know, because you already have some of the things you already want. For instance, who in their right mind leaves Internet Explorer as the default web browser? And except for somebody we both know and like, who else in their right mind would leave that as a default browser? Nobody. If if we all had the choice as Windows support technicians and users even, we would make it to when we installed Windows by default, Firefox would be installed. Right. And that's what Linux gives us the option of doing, you know? 
Do I want this installed by default or that? Do I want this look or do I want that? That's why there's so many choices. And as far as I'm concerned, there can't be too many choices. And that's just my belief. That's a good belief and it's it's well put. But so what you're saying is you could get out of the box Linux distros that fit your needs exactly with very little tweaking. So that's what you're saying. Yeah, it, in my logic, they get you closer to the end result to where you might only have to install one or two things or change one or two things, and you're pretty comfortable. So it's people where like it, you that have created a customized Linux distro and package it up as an ISO and call it like door to door geek X or something. And then, exactly. and then just release it. So that's why there's so many, because anybody could do it. Well, yeah. Now, most people are more professional than that. But yeah, that's the basic gist of it. Like, I might like audio editing. So I, when I do my audio editing, these are the tools I think that help my workflow. Gotcha. So I'll, you know, install those. I'll remove all the office suites. I'll remove all the mind sweepers. And I'll just make that as my distribution. And, you know, I think, well, somebody else might like this too. Right. And you never know what's going to take off, what's going to become popular. So people do it. That's okay. Yeah. Like, is that the goal of a lot of uh, distro creators? They want theirs to be like the next Ubuntu or something like that? Or, Well, I look at it, I look at it to be honest, as Leo Laporte's goal and your goal when you started this podcasting network, you just said to yourself, you know, I want to do this. You know, I know I'm not going to get millions of people, but I might be able to fill this niche kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I might be able to fill this better than other people. I think I have something valuable to offer. Same kind of belief. Gotcha. Very cool. I like it, Dor. Gotcha. Okay. Now, there is a guy out there who I believe is associated with Mike Smith at uh, Mike Tech Show, mm -hmm. who I got to say, if you, if you listen to this show and you don't know who Mike Tech is, um, I guess you're in a coma. <laughs> Mike, Mike Tech Show is, to be honest, one of the prominent tech podcasts there is, period. Because he's a real person talking about real things, real issues, and he comes to real resolution he's not just talking about the latest big thing unless it's his ipod but you know he can do that um there's a guy who was on his show i believe once or twice his name is buyer brown and i'm not to preference preference or whatever his preface whatever i'm not just saying this because in his latest episode and towards the very beginning he said i was very smart i'm not saying it just because of that just a little bit about that because of that. Well, no, because to be honest, I meant I meant to talk about him last week, and I and it totally slipped my mind. And I feel really bad for it. I did talk about him two weeks ago on Linux Basics, but okay, here it is. His podcast is called Freshly Minted: A Linux Journey. He's a newer user of Linux, but that's not really why people should listen to him. I feel like people should listen to him, even if you're experienced, you, you know, people should listen to him because he has an uncanny way of describing things and talking about complex subjects, but making them very understandable, very simple to follow along with, and very easy to comprehend. And, um, and to be honest, he has fun. He has a much higher production value than if I was doing a podcast all by myself, okay. then that would be. Let's just say that. Hmm. Um, for instance, he actually does his own theme song and he actually sings along with it. Um, that takes some guts out there, you know? Takes guts. Is he a good singer? You have to judge for yourself, Steve. Um, but I got to say, he also has little parts in there called um, Sensei pseudo and pseudo in the command line is how to you know become the administrator sensei pseudo is like a like a kung fu master kind of thing but this guy basically once in a while not once in a while he's he, he's on like once a show but he says things that are very true one of the best things you can do as a computer user is don't make assumptions when you're new to Linux. Don't assume, well, this is how I do it over here. That must be how I do it over here. You know, 
it isn't always like that. Once in a while, you just have to seriously stop. Don't overthink something. 90% of the time, it's much simpler than you're thinking it is. And that's the kind of thing he talks about. But he also goes into freedom versus capital F freedom. Um, he talks about very interesting topics, and he talks about them in a way that I really like. And I, and honestly, I don't talk about any pod. I, I never tell anybody to go to any podcast unless I believe it is among the best in the breed kind of thing. Going Linux.com, definitely one of the top period, bar none. Um, Linux reality, even though it's been over now for like three three years, virtually three quarters of the podcasts are still very relevant to things you do today in Linux. Buyer Brown is another one, uh, freshly minted a Linux journey. I will tell people to partake in, visit his site, download his cast, give it a listen. And the site is BBTAS. Dot com. That's, I want to hear him singing. Does he start singing in the beginning? The very beginning. Like uh, 30 seconds in, I want to say. Uh, he's minted the Linux Journey is brought to you by the Women Who Influence Radio, where every woman has a is voice of this? influence at yep. www.blogtalkradio.com I, I forward slash women who influence. All sponsors must submit products and services for review. BBTAS.com only promotes products and services of high quality and integrity. Send right inquiries here. to sponsor at BBTAS.com. <laughs> We are also Ready? a proud member of the Tech Podcast Ready? Network. If it's <laughs> right? tech, it's here. Now enjoy here. the show. Here. Are you a Linux geek? Are you looking for something fresh? Is this it? Maybe even minty? Incredible by our brown coming to you live. BBTAS.com only promotes you products talk. and services. All right, we'll get it. You guys have to go listen to it for yourself. We'll find it. Later. Yeah. What I'll do is when this show gets posted in Google Plus, I'll put a a adjoining MP3 file where it's just <clears throat> the uh, theme song. Okay, if you remember to do that, that's fine. I actually have it. I forgot to upload it. Okay. So, All right. What else, what else you want to go over? And I'm going to put Steve Gibson and say I have a um, oh God, what does he call him? Not a recant, but a a correction, whatever it's called, from last week. And oh, I miss errata. Errata, doesn't he call it? Errata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good man. You pay <laughs> attention. Um, last week, I said I could not install Windows Server because it wouldn't let me do it without, I think I said 8 gigs of RAM. Whatever amount I said, I was wrong because Windows Server, supposedly you can do with 1 gig. We know we can't, but... What I was actually referring to was small business server 2011. Um, I think it was standard A edition. You cannot install it in anything less than eight gigs of RAM. You literally start the install process and it says, you know, you do not meet the system requirements. Press OK to reboot. So that kind of perturbed me a little bit. But I wanted to make a correction because I don't like saying things that are wrong. <laughs> okay. On to some good stuff. Okay. It's, it wasn't that long ago, Steve. Okay. The Humble Indie Bundle is back on again. Wow. Um, it never goes away. Is, it's, I can't believe how quick it was this time. If you go to uh, humblebundle.com, uh, Crayon Physics Deluxe, which has been on a couple of platforms, and I got to say, it's a pretty challenging game. A uh, game called Cogs, which I haven't heard of. A game called... VV, 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 <laughs> or it's WWW. It looks like VV, VV. Uh, Hammer Flight and another game called And Yet It Moves. I believe the pace of this has increased because of how utterly successful this has been. Yeah, they, I bet you they're going to get it just going full time, one bundle yeah. after the other. It wouldn't shock me if they go for two weeks, off for two weeks, go for two weeks, off for two weeks. Um, because you name your own price. I could literally, every two weeks, it seems like, afford to buy buy this bundle. And once you buy it, you can download it forever. And, you, and if I buy it, I download it for Linux. Tomorrow, if my son gets a Windows computer, <laughs> he could download the games for Windows. Huh. Hmm. Um, wow, know, these, we, these games look really, really cool, actually. 
I got to say the quality of games, once again, that these people got, I, I, I'm, I am, to be honest, blown away. I love the fact that once again, you can take your purchase price and you can move the sliders around. You can, de you can devote it to the developers of the game, the EFF, which is the Electronic Front Freedom Foundation? <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> Electronic. Frontier Foundation. Frontier Foundation. Okay. Child's Play, a uh, charity to help games who are underprivileged to at least enjoy some game time. And uh, the Humble Tip, which is to the site maintainers and the coordinators of this whole process. So you can literally say, I want to give all my money to the EFF. So maybe I remember what it stands for. Um, <laughs> and you can use Google Checkout, PayPal, Amazon whole bunch of different services you can use again if you have any money sitting around and you have any time you think you might have to be able to play a game or a nephew or a cousin or a grandson or a brother or you just want to support good positive things i'll throw that in there make you feel guilty go to humble.bundle.com give them a little bit of money and enjoy yourself some gaming very and cool. I'll say, and I have to add in, no DRM, no DRM, ha, ah, no DRM. <laughs> nothing to break, nothing to mess up, nothing to ruin your experience from just having fun. Awesome. VVVVV looks, it's so low res, but it's, it looks like it's actually kind of fun. I, that's what I thought. I said, this looks goofy, but I could have fun doing it. Yeah. Um, and EFF, I didn't know what it meant until I, as soon as you mentioned, I saw it on the video. Otherwise, I would have messed it up too. So, well, thank you for humbling yourself <laughs> while at the humble indie bundle. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, next quick you got to throw out there is please, people, please, everybody who sits back, armchair quarterbacking, complaining about how this changes, this sucks. I don't like this. Why didn't they do it like that? Here's your chance. We all in the normal world with IQs above 115 despise the Microsoft ribbon bar. And we don't like when good products like um, that Macintosh movie editing program just goes down the dumper, you know? Oh, uh, you mean Final we, Cut Pro? Final Cut Pro. We as people have no say with that kind of thing zero zilch they do what they want to do that isn't always the case which is another reason why i like capital f freedom and freedom and i like LibreOffice. office uh at omg ubuntu.co.uk they have a direct link to the LibreOffice office user survey this is where you as a user get a very equal vote with every other user on the planet to what you like, what you care about, what you deem is important in the interface, in the functionality and how it should and like what its goals should be as, as a uh, project. You know, should they focus on the word stuff? Should they focus on the base, the spreadsheet, the calc? I want to use my mouse as much as possible. I want to use my keyboard as much as possible. I care about the, you know, having lots of menu, you know, you can actually go in and cast your vote. And I encourage anyone, if you, especially if you don't like LibreOffice, here's your chance to vote to make it more like what you want. You know, that is very cool. I can't get the link open. Did you take the site down door with all of your promotion of it? I think uh, I also took it down today when I first put it on Google Plus because I clicked it. I did the survey. Two minutes later, I posted it up and I had three people in five minutes say, it ain't working. <laughs> really? I think it got Google Plus. <laughs> Google Plus. Awesome. Yeah. Check it but out, though, guys. It's omgubuntu.co.uk, LibreOffice user survey. Yeah, I think it's a, you don't see that too often. Let's put it that way. Right. And super quickie. It will be in the show notes that I'm pushing out to Google+. Plus. Paul is still the man for doing the actual full show notes because he put stuff in there that I completely miss. Join Google+, Plus, ding me on Google+, Plus, tell me you're a PodNuts person because you might 
be eligible for some cool stuff later. And if you need an invite, door to door geek at gmail.com. And you have to send me a Gmail account. Don't send me a Hotmail email address and say, give me an invite. It's kind of useless. Good point. Good point. Okay. Now we're going to roll through a lot of little things, Steve. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, including myself when I first got my Chromebook, were ultra short-sighted about the usability, the possibility of a Chromebook or a um, static one application operating system about what it can do, what you could do, what's the limits to it. And everybody first jumps the gun and says, I need to do this. I need to do that. And they don't even look. Okay. The first, and all these are going to be in the official Chrome store. Um, the first one is a, is a, um, is a HTML editor. There's like four or five ones in there. This one is just called HTML editor. No lie. I door to door geek.com is going to change soon. I've been doing it all from a browser based editor and I miss, I lose nothing. Everything I need to do is works because I typically work in a text editor anyway, but you know, that's just how I roll. <laughs> um, the next link is one thing that a lot of people don't know about and they don't even contemplate about. It's called the Flux Player, which I got a great name, guys. <laughs> um, this is a audio player in your browser. You don't need an application. All you need is this. You can point it towards files on your local um, computer, or you can actually put in, I believe, uh, podcast feeds and you can listen to audio. So if you're on a Chromebook, you do have local storage of some degree. So you can listen to audio. There is a video player too, but I couldn't find the link in time. Um, so you don't need extra programs to do that. Now, this next one is the one where you actually have some good screenshots, Steve. This is Jolly OS, okay? This is, amongst other things, a Linux distribution. It's Ubuntu, polished up real good kind of thing. Uh, and it attempts, for all intents and purposes, to be a web-based operating system, but it's installable. But they also have a Google Chrome extension that brings 80-ish percentage of that experience into your web browser. Mm -hmm. So you install it on a netbook, on an old laptop, on an old desktop, and then you give it, let's say, the login ID of Podnuts, password Podnuts, because this is a test. Then you install the plugin into Chrome. Login, Podnuts, password, Podnuts. You will see everything the same. Your installed applications that are applicable will cross over and be right there for you. Because they're not really installed. They're all browser-based. Most of them are browser-based. And by most, I mean, like, seriously, like, 90 ish percentage are. Only a very small percentage is actually installed. Hmm. It looks okay. cool. It, it, is, it is very cool, very flexible, quite snappily. Um, the next one, Steve, I put in there just for you. It's called Audio Tool. And I did have a secondary link to the actual website where you can just straight up go to the website and you can play with it. It is, from everything I saw, a kind of dynamic in the browser audio manipulation slash editing tool. Yeah. Not only can you dynamically drag and drop audio components into this grid-based system, but, and you can basically route audio through the system kind of thing. Um, you can put in there synthesizers, drum things, effects, levelers, I don't know what they're called. Um, all kinds of different components. Yeah, if you just click on that and it should launch it for you. Oh, that's right. It's browser-based. I could actually launch it. You can actually launch it. And here's my only shortcoming, Steve. I really don't understand what each component is, does, can be, should do kind of thing. Right. 
but it's just very easily on the right side, you get all of your components and you can simply drag and drop them into the interface and uh, cables, magic cables, connect everything together to where, you know, you have your game, your levels, your pants, your Vime control. I, I seriously have no idea what these things are. But if you know audio, I think it could be cool. Now, why is mine taking so long to load? Well, go back to the main page. Okay, okay click here. Uh, start making music in the cloud. Yeah, there you go. Gotcha. That's, what, that's what you need. Now, I'm not saying this is professional grade. I'm not saying this will get you from the beginning of a project completely to the end. But if you just need something really quick set up because you want to do something, I honestly believe this can get you part of the way through a task. Wow. This is still an emerging thing. Yeah, go ahead and pick one of those things. The one on the left is blank slate. All the other ones, yeah, that's blank slate. And you have all the pieces on the right side where you just drag and drop them in and bam, the component gets loaded in the browser and then pops up. Boy. And then pops up with all the bells and whistles and knobs, all the things that make, uh, you know, audio files a little giddy, I think. Very you cool. Know? Very cool. All right. I don't know why. Let me see. Enjoy the music, guys. <laughs> that's really neat. I didn't make it. I don't know how that music came on. I think another page is open. That's why. But this is gotcha. no. Th a lot of these things, if you are a musician, they emulate actual real things in the physical universe. That's like a, um, what are they called? Like an 808 machine for making drums. For all, drums. All these pedals look like boss pedals. boss guitar pedals like exactly copied off from that from boss so it's just neat this is really cool man i'm gonna play with this good find well now you're gonna see something else better but um okay moving to the next extension we go from fun and possibly useful in a place where you might be able to make a little bit of money by you know farming your talents out to a link called lose it um she doesn't listen I gave this to my wife because she's a woman and she's constantly obsessed with losing weight. So it's a Chrome extension called Lose It and it's from loseit.com. And I got to say, what she liked was the graphically pleasingly interface and the easy way to get charts and graphs and um, see how you're doing toward goals kind of thing. What she didn't like was the availability to add your friends into which she said, I ain't adding any of them people. Um, oh, you mean she didn't like that you could add your friends? She hated that. And yeah, she but she didn't, didn't yeah, but she didn't have to add anybody, right? And she didn't, you know, she right. didn't do that, right? That's how she rolls. Um, so if you can use it for fun, you can use it to better yourself, huh. kind of thing. Wow, that is very cool. Okay, next one. I'm not going to lie, Steve. I'm These letting are really, Kat... Go ahead. These are really awesome. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. This next one, I'm letting Cat out of the bag, okay? And that's okay because I trust you people. I've used this off and on for the last couple of weeks to find out what applications I'm going to pull on Android App Addicts. <laughs> it's a Chrome extension called Android Freeware. Now, I know the website, it seems like it has all the same information, I like the simplicity of having the icon on my blank screen when I launch it up. And I really like the interface to these apps, how to browse, how to search, always gives you the um, codes. So if you have your phone on, you just bang, there you go, the app's on your phone. I like doing application discovery through that interface. Huh. I'm, okay. checking, I'm checking it out now. It's very cool. This ghost app one's very freaky. Yeah. Um, the next one, if you don't like the dreaded, utter, soliloquific insecurities of Dropbox and you're on Ubuntu, you might as well look at, U, at um, Ubuntu One. Two gigs free for above two gigs, it's more than Dropbox. I kind of don't suggest people to use that unless 
they are really truly dedicated to ubuntu one and they really want to support the company to do better okay you can get a ubuntu one application chrome extension add-on to where you can very easily upload files from your chromebook because it has local storage to your ubuntu one storage or bring things down and i know the last time i had a web interface to some um, multimedia files, I could stream my audio to it. So that was fun. Wow. Um, That's really neat. Yeah, so you, do you use Ubuntu One a lot? I have it as a default for a certain set of files. So on every new install of Ubuntu, one of the first things I do is I go to Ubuntu One and I download my Pigeon profile, my latest uh, Chrome a uh, profile with all my extensions already in it, all my themes, all my uh, cache history, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, certain preferences I, I, I keep on there. Now, this one might blow your mind. It, it's called WebVNC. It is a browser-only based VNC client to remote into other computers. You need nothing installed on your computer for this to work. Hmm. On your other computer, you have to have a VNC compatible server, I believe is what you have on the other computer, the yeah. server to remote into. Yeah. So you so you don't need to go install all these other applications to do basic remote control. Granted, VNC is not the most secure thing in the world, but you know, when you're in a pinch, you'll do what you need. Um, cool. Next one's going to look familiar to you, Steve, because um, I've definitely talked about this kind of thing before on many other shows pomodoro dowski this is for the pomodoro technique um to help individuals with adhd focus um a focus on doing work and then when you're not focus on not doing work um people like myself with adhd really need assistance in both you know, focusing to focus and focus to not focus. Gotcha. I know that's it. I know that doesn't make any sense. No, it does. But I need it. I like it. I use that one a lot. Um, this is another one I think they're going to, that, that, that to people who don't understand might be mind blown, but to people who know this one makes perfect sense. This one's called Cups Panel. Sorry, Windows, you can't use it. This is only for Mac and Linux. Um, CUPS stands for Common U Unix Printing System. This is the standard way that Mac does, and by default does, Linux can, virtually every distro by default, can share printers with CUPS. And it's uh, once you get it set up correctly, a, a la, you have a computer with a printer you go into the cups you add it as a shareable printer then from any other computer it is so simple easy to add that printer as a printing source um the thing i like about it is it basically carries all the drivers over by itself so you have to do zero work and if you have the same username same password on both computers and if you set it up properly and say share this one out to the local network then you install your operating system on this computer with the same username same password when you boot up that printer will already be in your queue and ready to be printed to huh. wow. yeah I, i'm a big fan of cups once i figured it out what it was why i should use it i really enjoyed it a lot wow then to something completely non-productive this is not the real thing it's a legend of zelda chrome app where you install the extension you click the button voila you're playing a zelda clone hack it ain't the same thing but it's a good time color when you're on the power technique and taking a break um, the, the legend of zelda and the lampshade of no real significance is the full name i know i i forgot about that but that, <laughs> that is fantastic that's cool okay now this one's not an extension this is a centralized and this was a term that one of your 
BuddyZ likes a lot, centralized management of all of your web content. This took a second for me to wrap my head around. This is remote centralized management for all your other remote files, all of your remote property, all of your um, all of your Google Docs, all of your Dropbox files, all of your Sugar Sync files, all of your Flickr stuff, all of your Yahoo Mail stuff, your Shutterfly, your Google Docs, your Facebook, your Hotmail, your Box.net, your Photo Bucket, your Snapfish, your Zoho, and it goes on and on and on and on. Jeez, man. What this is, it's an easy, easy place to go in, manage all those other services, and in one click, back them all up, back up all that data to your personal box. Really? All via the browser. So hypothetically, I'm in my Chromebook. I can connect to my Flickr. I can connect to my Google Docs. I can connect to the Hotmail I use for spam accounts. And then I can, in one click, back up all my vital data to my Chromebook. So I'm a big fan of this service. Now, the question is, is you as a user have to stop and think, do I trust Primadesk with uh, OAuth authentication to these other services? Right, right. I do. If it's on Lifehacker, I kind of feel okay about the product. I think they've been vetted enough, you know. Yeah, it is a lot of credentials to give out, but. Well, for the sites that accept it, it will only be OAuth, which means oh, okay, good. you don't give them your credentials. You do a pass-through technique, which means they get a token with very limited access to your account. Now, for hmm. the services that aren't as modern, the you give them your username and password. Right. Cool. Okay. This is hot. Not only how the presses, because it was teased and rumored about three or four days ago, and today it got semi hard confirmed. Mozilla is coming out with a mobile operating system. Yes. It is going to be it is going to be called Boot to Gecko. Gecko is the back end rendering engine that takes all of the code that comes into the Mozilla Firefox browser, and it's what churns through everything, churns through the JavaScript, the HTML, everything else under the sun, and displays it properly to in our interface. So it's going to be a Chrome OS-esque, Chrome OS-esque yeah. operating system. Neat, man, neat. And I tell you, I am a fan of Google too much. Okay, but this is something I would absurdly get behind. I don't even use Firefox. Why? Because Google Chrome is better. But with that said, I would support this more than I support Chrome OS because this is an open and fr open source free project to make something great. This is not a single corporate entity making billions of dollars a year. You know, they're trying to just make their own thing. Some people might say they're late to the game, whatever, you know. At least they're doing it. Hey, I'm all for it. And if, and seriously, don't be shocked. I don't know how broad this is going to go. I don't know what kind of devices they're going to shoot for, but they are going to need community support. And if anybody can get community support, it's going to be Mozilla to get individuals to help create drivers for hardware. Cause that's going to be the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. But if they make a operating system that I can install on my smartphone, I, oh, well, I guarantee you, I'll try it. But don't be shocked if during Android App Addicts. Uh, I don't think Door needs something uh, for a smartphone. Hang on. The beauty hang of on. it is. I missed you, Door. Sorry. Let's see, hang on. You said, don't be surprised. Are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, there's your video. Just came back. Um, Sorry. Lost you at, don't mm -hmm. be surprised during Android App Addicts. You want to take it from there? Yep. It, if I come on with HTML5 web applications uh, because 
they're going to be full. They're going to be rich. They're going to be really quick to load. They're going to be fully featured. I mean, fully functional too. With WebOS, I don't know how far that's going to go. I don't know how successful it's going to be, but I know it's beautiful and I know the apps that are there are functional. It's the same basic concept. It's all web applications. Android is compiled Java, this, that, which means there's extra overhead, extra load kind of thing to it. Right. I, 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 I honestly think this could be the um, dark horse in the race, I think is the right word. I think there's going to be a lot of fans behind this. So I don't know how... Be- how- Microsoft is usually the dark horse in these kind of races. <laughs> right. The yeah, dark horse. Yeah. Well, I'll just say, to be honest, I, and I, I would much sooner take money out of my own pocket and contribute to this cause because you, 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 I know, you know, when there's people, companies, individuals, products fighting for our attention, it only leads to great things for us as end users. This is true. This you is know? true. I'm testament to so that. that. So that's the other reason I want to support it. It would make Android better. It would make WebOS better. It would make iPhone better. And nothing's going to make Windows Phone 7 better. <laughs> I'm excited because I like Firefox. So I, I'm looking forward to this. You know, I like Firefox so much and just Mozilla that I wanted to buy a T-shirt from them. And um, I didn't because it cost 20 bucks and then 10 bucks to ship from the UK. So I didn't even right. buy a Firefox T-shirt. But I was going yeah. to. That's the point. Right. Well, and I'll say I like Mozilla a lot. I like the ideals of Firefox. I like Firefox a lot. I just don't use it. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, yeah, I don't know. I like the Orioles, but I won't pay to go to, go to a game. <laughs> okay. Next one. For people who are interested in automating stuff on their Linux desktop, i.e. Lalo, if he was to take this plunge to go to Linux for the rest of us.com or panas.com slash Linux, and he would learn some of the basic things using um, these two to two tutorials at l- Linux dot by examples.com, which I got to say, I like the URL name. I might actually remember it. Um, they have two tutorials, and they're basically examples, like they said, about a thing called Zenity, Z-E-N-I-T-Y. Okay. You don't have to know what Zenity is at all to use it. If Lalo would jump in tomorrow to Firefox and learn a little bit about Bash scripting and then see this, he wouldn't need any other thing. He wouldn't need any other tools to get his job done to automate virtually anything with user interaction is what this allows basically with a single command line that is at least moderately comprehensible for instance to have a calendar pop up where you pick a date here's the whole kicker with this that will completely match the rest of your desktop ui automatically you don't have to jump through any hoops it's not going to look goofy it's not going to look like java from 1998 it's going to look exactly like the rest of your desktop it's one string of code that starts with sz date whatever but then it says like dash dash calendar dash dash text pick a day title medical leave day 23 month five year 2008 so you know it's a calendar it says in the calendar pick a day the title of the window is medical leave and the default day or the default date is day 23 month five year 2008 so it almost is rational there's not stupid weird characters and ampersand signs all strewn through this is almost human readable code it takes it it has very low quick learning curve whatever that's called right but you can also do input boxes error messages information windows file pickers um help windows um notification windows progress meters showing you you know the computer isn't locked up it's doing something um question windows alert windows 
yes, no windows, um, number scales to where you give like a pick a um, the number, the minimum value to maximum 100, default 50, and then have the little slider that goes back and forth for you to pick a number. Hmm. And it also has a way you can output text where if you go into Windows, start, run, CMD, DIR, you get a directory listing. You could output that kind of listing to a window where people can actually click and highlight and copy and you know look at it, view it, and then hit close. They also have option menus to where you could say, you know, do you want to watch Linux for the rest of us videos.com with little then radio buttons? Yes, no, tomorrow, you know, tonight, or when I'm home. And you can you know click those options and hit OK. And the value is returned in the background to where you can do things with it. There's checkboxes, there's all kinds of basic a lot. A lot of basic manipulation you can do in Windows that could really fulfill a lot of needs if you want to do simple applications or semi-automated task routines. Hmm. And, you, and you don't have to know C++. You don't have to know any of these weird and weird coding languages. It's pretty damn neat. Yeah. And really, simple, simple enough that people could sink their teeth into. Well, I love it because the examples they give are good what it's based off of is just as good to where you can literally say to yourself, I need something to do this. Look at the examples, ah, copy paste. And this says, okay, let me change this from, you know, medical leave to mom's birthday, you know, and you can just replace words and then you're good to go. Hmm. Um, okay. Next thing should make, other operating systems users' heads explode. So if you're on another operating system, you might want to put your like hand on your top of your head. Okay. Ubuntu 11.04 and SUSE, I think it's called 11.4 and future versions of Ubuntu and future, and future versions of SUSE. If you have an Epson printer that was made after 2005, I believe is when they say, something like 85% of um, a, a two, over 268 Epson inkjet printers launched after 2005 are applicable for what I'm about to say. This will grow, this will get better. But if you have a 2006 Epson Makalaka 26854 inkjet, Okay, and you have Ubuntu 11 and 4. You literally turn your computer on. Huh. I can do that. You take your printer, you plug it into the wall. Yeah, don't lick your fingers before you do it. Okay, <laughs> then you take the USB cable and you put the side that's not a rectangle into the printer and the hole that looks like that's not a rectangle. You take the other end of that USB cable and you find a spot on your computer that looks like it. It's gonna be a rectangle. <laughs> you stick it in your computer and you're done. Your printer is going to work. Wow. You do not have to do anything else. You don't have to download drivers. You don't have to expand files. You don't have to go to websites. You don't have to get a CD. You don't have to do nothing. Wow, that is the future If for people who still use printers. <laughs> well, I'll say this. Windows essentially can't do it right now because it will be too exploitable. Uh -huh. Sorry, that's the truth. Mac could do it, and it wouldn't shock me if they would do it, but only if a printer company pays them money. My belief, again, eh, my belief. Linux will do it with whoever the hell will give them the drivers. <laughs> you know? So... And I can tell you this literally, this whole thing just started maybe six months ago. And we already have from one company, almost 3000 printers in that database to where you don't have to do nothing and it works. So give it six months again, it's gonna be pretty good. A year from now, I don't know if you're gonna to have to ever install a printer. Wow. You know, unless of course it's brand, 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 brand new. Okay, 
This next one, Steve, this is one of the ones that I think is going to get you hot. Okay. Get, it might get you a little bit bothered. And then again, <laughs> you might not really care about it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> the name gets me hot. It's called Mix. M-I-X-X-X. <laughs> yeah, dirty. Um, what this is, this is a on-the-fly... Oh, I'm trying to think of the right way that the guy explained it to me. First off, open source. Second off, cross-platform. Lots of operating systems here, folks. This is a tool that you can use as a DJ, and you can actually do, like, um, the thinking of beats. No, 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 man. Come on. Where you can do the um, syncing of beats from one track to another to make it blend in. Right, right, right. I can't, I, 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 I honestly can't remember what that's called. But um, it is a cross-platform, even works on Vista and XP, folks. Um, open source GPL. Wow. Par- parallel waveform displays, waveform summaries, MP3 OG, wave flack, extra playback formats through plugins, fast database powered library so on the fly it can deduce what a song is and automatically tell you all the information about it and the beats per minute kind of thing because when you want to sync the songs up that's the kind of information you need it will also um sync and work with itunes libraries and rhythm box which is on linux libraries you can create playlist you can even if the two songs are picked up automatically, which the guy who I know told me about this says, you would seriously have to pick like an old thing from 1963 that 5,000 people bought and that's it for it not to be in this database. Cause it, it, it's using the same kind of system that, you know, almost every audio system uses now. You You pick one song, you pick the next song, it can actually align and sync them for you you don't have to do work really it also has the option to have two outputs so you can have your speaker output and then your headphone output output while it's playing the middle of song a to people in your headphones you can preview what is it going to sound like going from a to b right so right there you can tweak it as it's going this is honestly if you're a dj this is the kind of thing that i think you know, it can get you hot and bothered. <laughs> M-I-X-X-X. That is pretty cool. I always what? wanted to get into, every time I can see those DJ machines, I want to play with them, but I have no clue what I'm doing. This, this looks exactly like one of them. So I would have no idea what I'm doing with this, but it's got knobs and dials and lights. That's all it needs. That's all it needs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I seriously only went through like one fifth, not one anymore, one twentieth of the features this uh, this thing right. has sure. and and the rest of the features are not like blue yellow okay they're not like that they're like crossfade curve control um eqs multiple sound card support it's silly if you know somebody who wants to be a dj you yourself wants to be a dj or a dj came to you at one point in time and said i'm tired of spending thousands of dollars what can i do right Simple. You pay me 300 bucks and I'll tell you. And then you <laughs> take them to mixxx.com. Um, this one is one I think that honestly is going to blow your mind, okay? A lot of mind blowing this episode. I know, but pay no attention to the culture that might be referenced on this website because it might not be something that you like. It's called In The Mix. I N D A M I X X. I-N-D-A-M-I-X-X dot com. This is something I learned about from uh, Kla, um, from Klaatu, who we had on months ago about the uh, multi-media sprint, um, where he was on a mission to find every Creative Commons open source sound effects, sound file, font, art, anything he could to make central repositories of free content where you could reuse as you deem fit. He, in my mind, is a media genius. He knows more than I ever could, okay? 
this this here is hardware and or software the software you can buy a usb stick pre loaded with the standard version of in the mix for 99 dollars you can buy a os a complete operating system disc version for 99 dollars or you can buy a multi-touch windows 7 slash Migo dual boot tablet device or uh well the tablet six hundred ninety nine dollars or a um laptop 749 um um fully loaded um iso for netbooks or laptops for 99 dollars more and more and more and more hardware i know i haven't explained what this is okay this is a true portable studio where you can on the fly EQ, tweak, tune, level, all this kind of high-end stuff that I don't understand right there on the fly and you can stream it live to internet radio stations or to other um, sources. And it also comes with, for instance, I'm a guy who stands on stage and plays a guitar. I need other sources on my music because my guitar is not enough. This also comes with stuff like a, um, um, a uh, drum machine, digital, do uh, digital DJ software, um, multi-track digital audio workstation, and of course a portable player to play back what you're doing. Um, he witnessed a, a guy he knew about one time, like two months ago, sent him a link and said, go here tonight. He was like, I don't even know what this guy is talking about. He went to the link and it turned out this guy was streaming a concert. He helped engineer because he's a, he, because he's the audio engineer behind this. And he streamed the entire concert from the live place through this hardware out to the internet to a ice cast server. Klaatu said the audio quality he heard was absolutely absurd. He didn't think IceCast could do that kind of thing. And the guy told him after the fact, it is an IceCast that worked it. It's this, this, this Indemix portable studio, he said, is basically so powerful, so flexible and portable. Um, he said this does replace tens of thousands of dollars of hardware that people have used for years and years and years. Checking it out now. I'm just I'm trying to wrap my wits around it. It, does, it looks like it's many things in one. It's a recording yeah. studio slash broadcaster slash... Um, doll. Doll. Different, yeah, mm. different things. It's pretty damn neat. It even has our door in there somewhere. Jeez, this is weird. What yeah. a weird thing. Well, it's trying to be anything a professional audio engineer could ever need at their fingertips. Right. Right. I think it's really freaking cool. I'm just trying to wrap my wits around. Okay. It's, so it's it's a couple apps in one, the hydrogen drum machine. So it's mm -hmm. all in one ISO. Okay. I got you. I got you. Yeah. And, uh, so, and I'll say if you go to applications... Uh, no, let's go back to the home screen, Steve. Indemix.com. Scroll all the way down on the right side, pop up just a little bit, and you're going to see... Uh, okay, keep going up on the right side. Beta testers. Want to beta test Indemix 2? Put, if you put your name in your email address, they could very possibly, they, if you're chosen, they will send you their hardware for free for you to beta test really if you're an audio engineer or a aspiring audio engineer this is the kind of thing to be honest that can set you apart um if you're you know going to some trade school kind of thing and you're you know three months into it and you apply here and you get this when you come in the teacher is basically going to give you an a so he can play with your stuff but that sounded wrong. But you know what I mean. 
<laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I was almost done. <laughs> Sorry. That's pretty cool. Now, this is really neat. This is really neat. Wow, look at all that stuff. That's yeah. Very cool stuff. Well, yeah, and um, this basically, this is one of the obvious things I can say that supports RMS, Richard Stallman, just because it's free doesn't mean you can't make money off of it. This is a company that in my eyes, it, it's still fairly new, but they have, they're hitting that niche hard. <laughs> they're, you know, they're trying to do everything they can to be a complete package for, you know, what they're trying to offer. And I, I think it's really cool. It is really cool. They're really, so it's, you know, how everything's going mobile. This is like the mobile solution for recording studios. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Next thing I actually talked about mm, last week or two weeks ago on Android app addicts, but it's applicable here too. Prey, P R E Y. There's a downloadable dev package for U for Ubuntu. You can install it on a couple other Linux distros, but it's not as easy. So if you're using Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Jolly OS, Peppermint, any of those derivatives, you can download a .deb file and you can put tracking software on your laptop, desktop, portable Ubuntu device or whatever to where if your device does get stolen, this might help you find where it's at. <laughs> I love this um, kind of stuff. Yeah, and when it's in a computer, what it can do is if I have a stolen computer, I connect it to the internet, it knows the IP of where it's at. It can send it back to pray.com and give you at least a approximate address. And if you give that information to the police, they can go up to Comcast or whoever the provider is and says, what home address had this IP? <laughs> um, I think this is cool. I like to see these kind of applications being available on Ubuntu because their stuff can get stolen too. Sure. Okay, last thing we can just roll through real quick, Steve. It's at businessinsider.com. Okay. This isn't completely honest. They want to get clicks, but it's cool and it means well, and they're kind of right, with, but they're kind of wrong too. 12 things you see every day that wouldn't exist without Linux. Here's how they're not completely accurate. Number one. Android phones and tablet got their start in Linux. What? They are Linux. They didn't get their start in Linux. They are Linux. They're still Linux. Businessinsider.com is the site that, okay. Yeah. Okay. That was number one. Number two, supercomputers. We know that. We've been through that, Steve. Uh, Japanese high-speed rail is a very precise, very efficient system. No mistakes allowed. You know what I mean? If you make a mistake... In calculating something, they'll cut your hand off or out or something. You know, they're a culture. They demand precise things. And to use the Japanese train, to get it as precise as possible, they had to use Linux for its speed. <laughs> um, number four, high-tech traffic control. We went over this before, Steve. Linux is where it's at. San Francisco recently started using traffic controllers that are powered by Linux. <clears throat> yep, and um, I know Las Vegas... And there's a couple other main turnpikes where they use it too. Okay. Number five. Oh, I don't like Toyota as a brand. I think they cost too much. They recently joined the Linux Foundation and they basically said outright they want, you know, Ford has the uh, crappy Windows ding thing in the car. You know, um, sync. Sync. It's Windows. Toyota is going to have Lennox in their cars. Oh, what a feeling. I want a Toyota in a couple of years. Um, number six, Got Milk. Um, the top dairies, dairies, dairies in the U.S., they're actually a very complex system. I've actually seen this on History Channel, one of those channels. It's a very complex system, and cows are very sensitive and they're sensitive where things have to be at certain temperatures, certain times of the day, certain humidity, certain conditions for everything to result in the maximum amount of milk produced by cows. And those are basically 
automated robotic like systems. People don't even touch the cows anymore. The cows are then, and then, and then they, they slowly get herded over to here. So they wait, go wait, into you're, you're saying that Linux milks cows? Linux milks cows. And it literally takes a device and goes, and then, and it, you get milk. <laughs> and you can thank Linus Torvalds for that. <laughs> I want a t shirt that says Linux milks cows. I, I, I can get that done. Um, Number seven, the New York Stock Exchange is powered by Linux. The base economy of this country is entrusted to Linux. <laughs> Not a product made in the United States, but a product made by a Swede in college. <laughs> That's what we trust our, the foundation of this country's economy to. That makes me feel good. <laughs> Number eight, uh, particle physics, the Large Hadron Collider. We've been through that one too. You don't want that to blue screen death. Hmm. Um, number nine, air traffic control systems use Linux in the backbone as the base, um, as the backbone of co of a co communication and the framework to connect all of the radars, the lidars, the sonars, all that. They all use Linux. So that's another mission critical place. You cannot have downtimes or Windows updates demanding a reboot. Sure. Number 10, nuclear submarines. Two people who've been on subs and they say, yes, there's Windows on subs. You have to have Windows because certain people need that to get their job done. But the engine, the manipulation of the engine, the nuclear reactor and all that, it is all running L Linux because of the real time capabilities of, you know what the temperature is right now, right now, right now. So the system is very self-aware of itself and correct itself at such an insane rate of speed. And you have to have that when you're dealing with nuclear. <laughs> it says Red Hat, Go US government was powered by Red Hat, or the nuclear sub uh, yeah. from Lockheed Martin was powered by Red Hat Linux. Yep, good stuff. Number 11, of course, Google, Amazon, Facebook, G+, every other popular site in the world, except for Microsoft.com or Windows Update.Microsoft.com. Eh, probably aren't <laughs> Windows. Um, number 12, TiVo. One of the devices that people who know nothing about computer fell in love with. TiVo. And finally... Except it's slow. I thought Linux was supposed well, to be fast. That's your, that's your TiVo 3. <laughs> TiVo 2 was just fine. Really? I would go, go back yeah. then. I would go back. Well, it, it was that HD thing that sucked people in. Oh, it's HD. Yeah. It's, yeah. Only, but, only half the menus are HD. It's still slow. I, yeah, and a guy at work bought a TiVo 3 and he said, and he's a Linux lover, advocate. He would hump Linux. He took it back in two weeks and said, no, absolutely right. not. Right, right. And then number 12, Linus Torvald. <laughs> yeah. Linux, it took 20 years for it to come this far. And I feel very comfortable saying on its current path, projected path, if you don't know Linux in 10 years, I don't know how you're going to get by. It's just me. That is a good point. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I think you might be yeah, right about that. Well, because I know only like 2% or whatever of the desktops run Linux, but over 85% over of the internet web servers run Linux or Unix. <laughs> Very cool, Dor. I like the countdown. Good stuff. No problem. All right. We, let's, we, got, a time, we got time for a few emails here. Cool. Um, this is from Pascal. This is when you answered. Want me to read this one? Sure, sure, yes. Um, Pascal says, Hey, guys, just listen to your latest show where you talked about the Linux distribution ma distribution Magea. Two remarks. The word is not French, even though Mandriva came from France, but it's Greek, right. but it's Greek, and it means magic. The reason why it boots really fast, I'm running it in a virtual machine, is that when you boot into your freshly installed Magea, I hope I'm saying it right, the first time you get asked if it should remove stuff you do, it, it, you get asked if it should remove stuff you don't need, like language support or other for other languages, kernel modules for hardware you don't have. That makes the boot process way faster. It doesn't have to figure out what to load. There may be a downside to that, unfortunately, in case 
you have to change a piece of hardware, say your graphics card is broken, you want to put the card, put in the card of your friend, you might have some trouble if that is from a different manufacturer. But in general, I agree. Magea looks nice and could become an excellent Ubuntu for beginners. Mandriva already had a good reputation, especially as a distribution with KDE desktop. Keep up with your nice show, Pascal, from Berlin. Yep. Thank you very much. He, and he, I completely forgot, he is right. The first time boot, it literally like took the whole operating system and it took my computer and it just pushed it through that little hole and everything else it just left behind. Yes. So, so if I have hardware changes, I might run into issues. But if I don't have hardware changes, this is technically tweaked, tuned, primed for my hardware. That's why it boots so quick and it boots quick. Sounds good. I got to check that one out. Uh, let's do one more here. And then whoever sent us the rest of the emails, we're going to read them at the beginning of the show next week. Ah, I got a plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Justin writes, on Linux for the rest of us, number 49, the email about iTunes on Windows XP VM, 2 gig of RAM provided 20 gigs partition of you. I feel like we read this one already. All right, anyway. I think we did. Did we? Um, no, I'll read it again because I don't remember. Um, on Linux for the rest of us, number 49, the email about iTunes on Windows XP VM, uh, 2 gigs of RAM provided 20 gig partition, VBox shares to Linux side folder where music is stored. Under Linux, with 12 gig system RAM, the email about iTunes on Windows XP VM, under Linux, I don't know, I don't know where a sentence goes into that, but anyway, he says, I do this for syncing my iPod Touch, but did stumble upon one terrible problem. You can download podcasts and sync them to the iPod. You can download apps and updates to apps and sync that to the iPod. The only problem comes up is when there's an, I, an update for the iPod Touch. Upon activating an update in the VM, the iPod will be backed up, then reboots into recovery slash update mode, and identifies itself over USB as the different device that Linux has no handler for. Since Linux doesn't have a handler for it, it can't pass it up to the Windows VM. My workaround, I have a laptop that dual boots Windows XP with a copy of iTunes. All I use it for is iPod touch device updates. The original emailer will have to keep his Windows partition around for updates or borrow our friend's PC when they come up. That's from Draco Trapnet on Twitter, who is Justin. Sorry for botching the beginning of that, Justin, but I think we got the idea. Any comments yeah. on that door? I, I, I can't thank him enough because I would have never known that because I do not own any of those devices. Real quick, we got an email from uh, Tom. Tony. Tony, sorry, Tony. Um, there was a product. Uh, this wasn't it. I want to... Oh, it's called Tunes Viewer. I've never heard of this. This is a Linux application that can access the iTunes University, as they call it, where I can buy things from the iTunes marketplace without iTunes. That's what I'm gathering. It's called Tunes Viewer. I literally just heard about it. I don't know anything about it. But if this is true, then this can let someone continue buying songs from a place they know and stick with it kind of thing. It's an option. You know what I'm saying it's an option. But yeah, I would have never known about the failing of iTunes under a VM. So I definitely want to thank um, him for that e email. Yeah, no problem. Thank you as well. Uh, let's just finish them off here. We got two more quickies. Door, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get my ancient HP LaserJet 4P to work with Linux Mint via a TrendNet print server. I can't seem to find a driver, though. I went into Control Center, clicked on Printing, clicked on Add, and then I'm not sure what to do from there. I clicked on Generic Cups PDF Forward, but I can't find my printer listed. I tried to search for a printer to download, entered the printer model, and did the search, but that didn't seem to go anywhere either. Any thoughts? That's from Craig. Yep. Open printing. Openprinting.org is the schnizzle. You go there, you put in HP LaserJet 4P, and it says it's a black and white laser printer and works perfectly under Linux when you use the HP LIP driver. That's why you couldn't find a driver. How are you supposed to know it's called HP LIP? Which is why openprinting.org, any printing issue anything you go there first and it will definitely help you out 
Openprinting.org. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Last one is from Eric. Simply, with a one-liner, he says, Sousa, not Sousa, in regards to pronunciation. <laughs> and uh, you did some research. You said, it looks like we're both wrong, Eric. On SousaRoot.com, they say Susie, which sounds like the girl's name, Susie. 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 Um, so, and that's not even written in stone. So pronounce Seuss, Suze, Souza, Susie, any way you Susan want. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> I kind of take it as like local derivatives. You know, yeah. toilet, turlet, right, water. Right, right, Water. I, I take it as kind of be that thing. <clears throat> but the two guys at work who are Susie users, Man, they're really vehemently. I don't like arguing with them. What do they say, Susie? They say Suse. Suse. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's written in stone anywhere. I, I don't know. I bow to anyone who tells me a correct pronunciation. Vocabulary is my downfall. Okay. <laughs> don't take them up on that. I don't want to read any more pronunciation emails. If it, if it bothers you, I don't know. Edit right. that part out. All right. Look, this is, uh, if you want to send us an email, send it to mail at podnuts.com or door to door geek at podnuts.com. If you want it to go straight to door, he's going to be answering mm -hmm. it anyway, to be honest. Um, or hit him up on his Google Plus account there. If you want to send us a voicemail, we are willing to play it. The world can hear your voice and wants to. Call 7076 Podnut on a regular phone. We will get the voicemail and play it. Um, we might have missed a couple emails. I'm going to do a little search in my inbox to see if there's anything missed, but I think we got most of them. So thank you guys for sending them in. Dora, where could people find you if they want to uh, chat, contact you, ask advice, whatever they want to do? Okay, if they want, uh, door to door geek.com will be overhauled here soon. Uh, until then, you can shoot me an email, or if you want, and if, if you just want to learn Linux, period. You can ask me questions all day long. I honestly don't mind. But if you don't want to feel like you're harassing someone, Lennox for the rest of us.com, you can learn everything I know. And if it's not there and you want to know it, tell me and I will add it to it. And I just got to say, if you need backup for your friends and family and you don't want to deal with them, send them to any and they'll be hooked up. There you go. What a nice thing to say. It's our friend. He's a, it's our friend he's a good guy. It's our friend Leaf. Hmm? All righty. Well, that is going to be it for Linux for the rest of us for this week. Thanks, you all. Thanks, you, if that makes any sense. See you next time.